We are all familiar with this formula in which osmolarity is equal to 2 times sodium plus 2 times potassium plus urea and glucose. Therefore, the main osmotic component in the extracellular compartment is actually sodium. Osmolar homeostasis is achieved by control of the water intake and output. Intake is controlled by the thirst mechanism, while the control of urinary loss of free water is by a single mechanism mediated by the antidiuretic hormone. How does osmolar homeostasis occur? If there is an osmotic change in the intravascular compartment, this typically stimulates the osmoreceptors, which in turn will stimulate the hypothalamus, resulting in activation of the thirst center such that the organism will seek water, and also stimulation of the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus to secrete more antidiuretic hormone. The control of the osmoreceptors is actually very fine such that the osmolarity within the intravascular compartment varies by a very very narrow range between 285 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. However, there is an overriding mechanism in which when there is a fall in the intravascular pressure, the baroreceptors are activated. Irregardless of the osmolality in the bloodstream itself, the thirst center will be activated and ADH will also be secreted. It is very important to note this overriding mechanism of the baroreceptors resulting in a secretion of ADH irregardless of the osmolality in the bloodstream. Another very important concept is how concentrated urine or the conservation of free water is achieved. This is mediated only by vasopressin, also known as the antidiuretic hormone. When vasopressin occupies the V2 receptor, this leads to a cascade resulting in an increased collecting duct water permeability and subsequently generating a concentrated urine. It is important to note that ADH is a requirement for concentrated urine and it is the only single mechanism that can achieve this. A rise in plasma sodium is a potent stimulus for ADH and thirst. Note that the rise in ADH is linearly proportional to the plasma osmolality. The maximum achievable urine osmolality, which is the most concentrated urine you can get, is 900 milliosmoles per kilogram. At such maximum concentrated urine, even with additional exogenous antidiuretic hormone will not produce a further rise in the urine osmolality. On the other hand, the most dilute urine that a normal person can ever make is in a range of 60 milliosmoles per liter. Daily osmolar output in the urine is about 900 milliosmoles per day and this is contributed by the electrolytes excreted, urea catabolism, as well as osmols taken in the diet. The urine flow or the maximum amount of urine that we can make per day is dependent on the solute excretion. If we take the solute excretion in milliosmols per day divided by the urine osmolality in milliosmoles per liter, we have 900 divided by 60. This means that at maximum dilution with a normal daily osmolar intake, we can generate about 15 liters of urine maximum per day. The osmolar intake therefore determines the amount of maximum urine dilution and the amount of urine that a normal person can make. 
The next two slides are just summary slides to the approach of salt imbalance. When we approach a hyponatremia, it is divided into a non-hypotonic condition versus a hypotonic hyponatremia. For this, we have to compare the serum osmolality, which is measured in the lab, versus the serum osmolarity, which is calculated with the formula presented earlier on. Hypernatremia is usually an imbalance between salt and water in that it may be due to an unreplaced water loss or water movement into cells or it may be due to a sodium overload state. Further details will be covered in the subsequent lectures.